Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and since it is election night in the United States, I thought we would see what election night was like for the four presidential candidates in the election of 1860. Although this video will discuss election results, I wanted to emphasize how presidential candidates heard the news of their elections and what an election night was like for these four men, Abraham Lincoln, Stephen Douglas, John Bell, and John Breckinridge. I quote heavily from four books in this video, especially when the election results are mentioned, because some authors simply have a better way of conveying numbers than myself. Those books will be in the description if you'd like to check them out. Although born in Vermont, Stephen A. Douglas moved to Illinois to pursue his law career, where the requirements were less stringent. He held multiple offices from that state, including Secretary of State of Illinois, Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of Illinois, a member of the House of Representatives, and a U.S. Senator. He was a Democrat and well-known throughout the country for his political prowess. When the Southern Democrats pulled out of the Democratic National Convention, he was nominated by the Northern Democrats as presidential candidate for their party. For all four men, this was an election to save the nation itself. Stephen wasted no time in campaigning, especially in the South. Douglas turned in the worst performance of his tour when he spoke from the steps of the Capitol at Montgomery, Alabama on November 2nd. The little giant was obviously suffering from fatigue and appeared confused. For almost three hours, he struggled through his speech, stammered, lost his voice, and repeated himself with exasperating frequency. His audience returned his pleas for sanity and the Union with hoots of derision and an occasional egg or overripe tomato. Douglas made the last speech of his campaign at Mobile on the evening of November 5th. The election was the next day. Once more, he began with a defense of popular sovereignty, but soon turned to a plea for the Union. He added for the first time that he would not be a candidate for any election that wound up in the House of Representatives. The thousands of people who had come to hear the little giant listened quietly, applauded politely, and in the end, voted for Breckinridge. He stayed at the Battle House in Mobile, but spent most of his waking hours down the street at the office of the Mobile Register, where he sat with his old ally Forsyth and watched the election results as they came off the telegraph. Abraham Lincoln was born on the frontier in Kentucky. His family eventually moved to Illinois, where Lincoln started off as a postmaster, a surveyor, and then studied to be a lawyer. His political career was lackluster, being only a member of the Illinois House of Representatives and the U.S. House of Representatives, and the latter for only one term. What made him stand out and become nominated by the Republican National Convention for their presidential nominee was his widely publicized debates with Stephen A. Douglas for the U.S. Senate seat for Illinois. He also gained a great reputation after his address at the Cooper Union that gained him support from numerous newspapers. When the convention met, Lincoln was everyone's second choice, and he became the nominee. On the morning of November 6, 1860, in Illinois' capital of Springfield, Abraham Lincoln awoke and walked downstairs to have breakfast with his wife, Mary, and his two sons, Willie and Tad. Robert was older than his brothers and had begun law school at Harvard, so he was not joining his father on this special occasion. After breakfast, he made his way down to the Illinois State House, where rooms were dedicated to each party. Inside the room dedicated to the Republican Party, Lincoln was surrounded by his friends and campaigners, John Nicolay, his private secretary, and David Davis, his campaign manager, to name a few. Lincoln did the typical political gesturing by shaking hands and kissing babies. He greeted numerous admirers and voters. A little after midday, Lincoln walked down the steps to the voting station, where he identified himself and was given a ballot. It was unseemly for a president to vote for himself. The Republican ballot listed all the Republicans running in their locale and at the top, Lincoln's name along with the vice presidential candidate Hannibal Hamlin and below the Republican electors. Lincoln took the ballot, tore off his and Hannibal's name as well as the Republican electors. When the deed was done, he returned to the Republican room and continued his meet and greet. But as the day wore on, the room became extremely crowded. He left the room and the state house to take up the telegraph company's offer to set up in its headquarters so he could get the election returns as they came in off the telegraph. The state house rooms had a telegraph wire and a telegrapher for the purpose of announcing the returns, but the crowd became too large and the telegraph headquarters 
allowed Lincoln to sit in peace with his private secretary and read the returns. As the numbers came in, the telegrapher would simply hand the candidate the note. Lincoln would place it on his knee while he pulled out his spectacles and scanned the note. He analyzed each return that came through the telegraph headquarters. His mind dissected what each series of numbers meant for each candidate and each state. A born and raised Kentuckian, John C. Breckinridge took the country by storm as an influential politician at a young age. His time as a member of the House of Representatives confirmed his strong stance as a slavery proponent and his fame or infamy in that regard saw the Democrat Party pick Breckinridge as the vice presidential running mate for James Buchanan. When that ticket won the presidency in 1856, John became the youngest vice president in U.S. history, still holding that record. The Southern Democrats who pulled out of the Democratic National Convention in 1860 nominated Breckinridge as their candidate. John Bell, the Tennessean, was a famous politician by the time the election of 1860 rolled around. Bell had been Speaker of the House of Representatives, Secretary of War under William Henry Harrison and John Tyler, and a United States Senator. He had been a Democrat under Andrew Jackson, but when Old Hickory attacked the National Bank, John Bell began to break away and join the Whig Party. In 1860, there was a rift between the two major political parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. Many former Whigs in the South refused to support either party and created their own, the Constitutional Union Party. Their platform was simple, to recognize no political principle other than the constitution of the country, the union of the states, and the enforcement of the laws. To say the least, it was a party dedicated to keeping the country together and avoid the question of slavery. John Bell became their nominee at their Baltimore convention. Breckinridge and Bell spent the election night in their respective homes in Lexington, Kentucky and Nashville, Tennessee, hearing the results as their surrogates would get word to them. On election day, men all over the nation went to the polls to cast their ballots. A colonel of cavalry, Robert E. Lee, who felt that Douglas should long ago have withdrawn, gave his vote to the vice president, as did another Virginian in the Shenandoah Valley, Thomas J. Jackson. In Ohio, Edwin M. Stanton, who regarded Breckinridge's election as the only hope of averting secession, voted for him. And of course, Benjamin Butler did the same in Massachusetts. Down in the Deep South, Judah P. Benjamin, Jefferson Davis, William L. Yancey, Robert Toombs, and a host of others followed suit. In all, 849,781 people voted for Breckinridge, but they were not enough. Douglas polled 1,376,957, and Lincoln received 1,866,452. Bell got 588,879. Just over 60% of the people had shown that they did not want Lincoln in the White House. Yet, thanks to the Electoral College, he would be president. The results by state were indeed strange. Poor Douglas sank it in the popular vote, won only nine electoral votes, making him dead last. Even Douglas, who in retrospect had appeared resigned to defeat as early as the summer, was not prepared for the news that began to make its way with exasperating slowness over the wire. He had scored a clear victory in only one state, Missouri, with its nine electoral votes. His triumph there might have been predicted for all the states Missouri was most closely identified with those two bastions of Douglas's strength below the Mason-Dixon line, the border and the river. Yet even in Missouri, Douglas won by a margin of less than 500 votes. Douglas's only other victory in New Jersey, where he picked up three of the seven electoral votes, Lincoln claimed the other four, a more realistic explanation would seem to be that the fusion movement had scored its only triumph there in 1860. The New Jersey victory was far more significant than its three electoral votes might suggest, for it meant that Douglas was the only one of the four candidates who had been able to win electoral votes in both a slave and a free state. Perhaps the Little Giant was the most truly national candidate after all. He could also take the consolation from the news from California, which he lost to Lincoln by only 600 votes. Bell carried Virginia, Tennessee, and to Breckinridge's humiliation, Kentucky, winning 39 electoral ballots. 
Breckenridge won Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina in the South, and Maryland, Delaware, and North Carolina among the border states. His electoral total was thus 72, but Lincoln stood far out in front with 180, having carried the entire North, as well as California and Oregon. The distribution of the vote was of considerable importance. Lincoln had polled two to one against Douglas in the North, but nothing in the South, and only a few thousand in the border states. Bell's popular vote was primarily centered in the states that he carried, though his total in the slave states combined with Douglas's actually made more than Breckinridge's. Just as most of the nation was opposed to Lincoln, so were most of Southerners and the border states opposed to Breckinridge, more particularly to the hard line and widely touted disunion tendencies of his most vocal supporters. From all these totals emerged an interesting and significant fact, which can be regarded as reflecting more on Breckinridge personally than on the men and ideas he had allowed himself to represent. Lincoln's popular vote was wholly northern. Bell's was primarily in the border and in the south. Douglas's total was divided almost three to one between the free and slave states. Breckinridge alone, of all the candidates, showed an almost equal appeal in all the different sections. He received approximately 259,000 in the Deep South, 312,000 in the seven border states, and 279,000 in the free states. Clearly, he was not regarded everywhere as a disunionist. Even if Breckinridge had been the only Democrat candidate, he still would not have had the necessary 152 electoral votes to have won the election. It was imperative for him to have won some northern states in order to reach that threshold. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope this clarified the ins and outs of the presidential election of 1860 and helped you visualize how each candidate spent this critical night. Thank you all again and have a great day. Historian, historian, where do you roam? Historian, historian, far, far from home. Have history will travel, he's the card of a man. A professor with knowledge in the hard land. To educate the world. A professor of fortune is a man called Historian Historian